Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to address so valuable a conference, and may I congratulate those who have arranged and supported it. The topic of mediation must concern anyone interested in the administration of justice. Different legal systems, of course, experience different problems. In some cases, litigation is quite speedy but costly, but in others, it may be cheaper and slower. Almost invariably, however, litigation or arbitration involve time and money that could be more productively employed elsewhere. And very often, they also involve a considerable degree of personal stress before a court decision determines the final outcome. The arguments in favour of encouraging amicable resolution of disputes by agreements to which both parties have given their consent seem to me overwhelming. There is, of course, a balance to be struck between mediation and trial. The title of this conference recognises this. The word balance comes, I have no doubt, from Article 1 of the Mediation Directive 2008-52-EC. This states that the objective of the directive is to facilitate access to ADR and to promote the amicable settlement of disputes by encouraging mediation and by encouraging a balanced relationship between mediation and judicial proceedings. What does this mean? I think it's a recognition of two points. First, mediation depends upon agreement. Ultimately, any party has the right, which is enshrined in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, to have a dispute resolved in a court, unless, of course, some other forum like arbitration or expert evaluation has been agreed. But that doesn't mean that it is always reasonable for a party to insist on the right to go to court. It doesn't mean that courts cannot encourage a more consensual approach. And it does not prevent courts, at least in English law, sanctioning a party who unreasonably insists on obtaining a court judgment, when the same or a better result could well have been achieved more quickly, more cheaply and less stressfully had there been a bona fide attempt to mediate. Sometimes litigants are their own worst enemies. The second point recognised by the idea of a balanced relationship is I think that mediation is not a universal panacea. There are certain cases where it may not be so well suited. Claims for injunctions and other claims where urgent interim relief is required. Cases where an authoritative decision is required to give guidance in an important area of activity, public or business. Cases of clear liability where a defendant is seeking to delay the evil hour by any means and a summary court judgment may dispose of the whole matter without delay. In a whole range of cases, however, mediation can achieve results, even though parties without previous experience of mediation may not always at first sight believe or expect this to be possible. There are some striking experiences with this in English legal experience. Mediation activity in the United Kingdom has in consequence increased, even though not as much as some might have hoped or expected. CEDA, the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution in London, says that over 600 law firms, over 1,200 companies, 50 public sector organisations and 15 government departments use its services each year. It says that its current activity is running at over 650 commercial mediations each year with a consistent settlement rate of 75 to 80 per cent. A number of lawyers have ceased to act as litigators and have trained as and taken up full-time careers as mediators. Retired judges have also trained and been successful as mediators. Under procedural reforms introduced in the 1990s, the Wolf Reforms, Pre-action protocols are now required before much standard litigation commences and they draw express attention to ADR procedures. The procedural rules of court expressly require English courts to manage litigation and to encourage the use of ADR procedures and they permit the efforts which are taken or sometimes not taken by a party in that regard to be taken into account by the court when deciding what costs orders to make. Courts have on this basis, at case management conferences and in pre-trial reviews, forcefully advocated mediation and have expected a party refusing to try mediation to give an explanation as to why he, she or it did so, on pain of incurring a possibly disadvantageous costs order. 
Courts have, on the other hand, taken the view that they have no power actually to order mediation or to refuse access to the court to a party who positively refuses mediation. The leading authority on that is a Court of Appeal decision called Halsey v. Milton Keynes General National Health Trust in 2004. But courts have frequently adjourned or stayed cases for a period with an invocation to the parties to consider using that period for mediation. The commercial court, where I used to sit, was a pioneer in this respect. Since 2001, government departments and agencies have been party to an ADR pledge to use ADR in all appropriate cases. And since 2004, there has been a national mediation helpline which serves all county courts and is backed up by panels of mediation advisors accredited by the Civil Mediation Council. In 2007 to 2008, following a successful pilot scheme, the Small Claims Mediation Service was rolled out to cover all of England and Wales it provides access to mediation in all defended small claims, that is claims having a value of up to £5,000. This service commonly operates over the telephone without the expense therefore of meetings, it conducts over 10,000 cases a year and it has a 73% settlement rate. In 2011, the Cross-Border Mediation EU Directive Regulations 2011 gave effect to the provisions of Directive 2008-52-EC regarding confidentiality and extension of time limits or prescription. The outstanding question, which your conference is concerned with, is whether there should be a more mandatory aspect to lead mediation. There are two problems. One of access to justice before a court. The other, that you can take a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. But these are only problems if one is contemplating a form of order relating to mediation which actually precludes a party from litigating or precludes a party from litigating within a reasonable time or a form of order which purports to require parties, impossibly, to agree. No one in the United Kingdom at least is contemplating going that far. In March 2011 our Ministry of Justice consulted on proposals to introduce a more mandatory aspect to mediation, an element of compulsion as it put it. This would involve the automatic referral by courts of small claims cases to mediation. The understanding was that unreasonable refusal to engage bona fide in mediation would then be relevant on costs, but that a party who determined, reasonably or unreasonably, that there was no future in mediation could not actually be debarred of its or his or her right of access to court. For larger claims, the Ministry contemplated no more than compulsory information sessions about mediation. The consultation took place and following it in February this year, the Ministry announced that it planned to have automatic referral to mediation for all small claims up to £10,000, with a possible future increase to £15,000 but the proposal for mandatory information sessions for larger claims appears to have met little support and to have been dropped. As yet, however, there has been no new legislation and therefore no new procedural rules. May I conclude by welcoming the insights that your conference will bring in this area and uh, no doubt they will be added to by the forthcoming Italian Constitutional Court decision about the Italian law which I understand provides for a form of mandatory mediation, a decision uh, to be given I believe on the 23rd of October. I'm very sorry not to be with you but I do look forward to reading the conference report and to learning from the broader European experience which it will portray. Thank you very much.